My name's Ian Panja. Um, I'm a GP in St Albans in Hertfordshire. I've been working for 15 years. Um, come April, I would have been 15 years as a GP partner in the NHS. Um, I have been sort of working by instinct, really, on lifestyle medicine for many, many years, realising that a lot of what we do as practitioners doesn't really help a lot of our patients. And I think deep down, a lot of us as doctors realize this. And this is what spurned this course. Um, what I'm gonna do is just run over the, a kind of an overview of lifestyle medicine. So give you the principles and set the scene for why lifestyle medicine is really important. Lifestyle medicine is a branch of medicine dealing with research, prevention, and treatment of disorders caused by lifestyle factors such as nutrition, physical inactivity, and chronic stress. That one works quite well for me, um, and I don't want to get into arguments about what lifestyle medicine is, because there, there are lots of people in this room that have come from different backgrounds. So I can see people who studied functional medicine. I can see people who work in integrated health. I can see people who work in the NHS. Um, we're all trying to do the same thing, and I see it as a bunch of circles in a Venn diagram. There's a huge amount of overlap. It doesn't matter whether you're primary care, secondary care. We're all trying to do the same thing. We want people not to suffer, and we want them to feel better. And that, broadly speaking, is lifestyle medicine. It's, it's really a public health term, but when it comes to the patient opposite you, you need to bring that public health to that individual to make targeted changes with their lifestyle that's going to make them feel better. So it does filter down to, to one person. The lifestyle medicine has been around for years. So I've got a quote up from Erasmus from 1520 Prevention is Better Than Cure. He wasn't a medic, very clever guy, philanthropist, philosopher. Then there's let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food by the main man himself, Hippocrates. Um, the subject of sleeplessness is once more under public discussion. The hurry and excitement of modern life is held to be responsible for much of the insomnia of which we hear. And most of the articles and letters are full of good advice to live more quietly and of platitudes concerning the harmfulness of rush and worry. The pity of it is that so many people are unable to follow this good advice and are obliged to lead a life of anxiety and high tension. That is from the BMJ, 1894 that's from. That, that just shows you that actually we've known about this for a while, but actually the, the, the culture shift has moved towards medication and interventions of other sorts. And the next slide is basically about lifestyle medicine now in 2018 and in the media. So I've got a couple of articles on Pulse and then there's something in The Telegraph by Simon Stevens which says NHS should prescribe tango dancing in book clubs, not a pill for every ill. Then there's an article by Claire Gerarda from 2016 in Pulse, GPs not need to start prescribing lifestyle medicine, which we are today. Um, and then Asim Malhotra and some other commentators. The next slide is the medical versus lifestyle model. This is really the difference between what we are taught at, at medical school or nursing school in terms of how we approach health and disease. So the medical approach is very disease specific and disease orientated. We're forced to make a diagnosis. So someone comes in with symptoms and we are constantly trying to give it a name. You know, so someone comes in with, I don't know, pins and needles in their hands and you sort of think, well, what could that be? And you're sort of generating a hypothesis, but generally it's disease orientated and you want to give something a name. And it's, it, it tends to go down this specialist route. So it starts with generalists and then as, as things work or don't work, you go towards a, a, a more specialist approach. And it's based on similar treatments and protocols. So if you take a gynecology clinic, for example, this is a really good example of this model. So there are pathways for patients, you know, whether it's recurrent miscarriage or early pregnancy scanning or cancers, you know, and that would have, that will be subdivided into the types of cancer. So that's the sort of conventional medical model. And it's based on symptoms and screening for early detection of disease. Now the lifestyle model in a way looks the other way. It looks, it's, it's more sort of health oriented and preventive. So it's looking for root causes of why someone has symptoms. It's not just waiting for disease to happen because when it comes to non-communicable disease, that's not the case. There are reasons why those things happen. And guess what? Most of them are down to lifestyle. So. What we're trying to do is look at those factors and trying to individualize them, look at biological systems that are affecting this individual that are giving rise to symptoms and messing around, if you like, with those biological symptoms using lifestyle tools. 
it's not just about diet and exercise. This is the next slide. Um, diet and exercise is sort of the lifeblood of lifestyle medicine. And if it was that straightforward, we'd all be well, you know, eat a bit better and exercise a bit more. It doesn't work for everyone. Um, and beyond food and movement, your mindset as a person, how you relax, how you switch off, what your sleep quality is like, what your environment is like. You know, if you live next to the M1, you know, you're gonna have a lot of noise and you're not gonna be able to sleep. So that's gonna affect your lifestyle and that will in turn affect your biological systems and your genetics, increasingly important. And the Royal College of GPs actually, they, they have been talking about nutrigenomics more and more. Um, and I think in the future, we'll see that that becomes a more important part of how we treat patients. And you'll see through the case histories that we have later in the day, how that can be relevant. The other thing is, is that the other thing to get across to you is that that list on the left on that slide directly affects the systems on the right. So the biological systems in, in, that are constantly at interplay in our body um, are your gut, your immune system, which is a synonym in a way because most of it is in the gut, your endocrine system, your nervous system, your cardiovascular system, and your musculoskeletal system. So if one of these systems goes wrong, you can bet your bottom dollar that gradually, bit by bit, all the others will start to go wrong. Um, they're constantly communicating. So that's just something I want you to just get used to as a concept. I know a lot of you in this room know a lot of this because you've been practicing like this for a while, but there are a lot of people here who this is completely new to them. So just start thinking about systems and all of those inputs that can affect them. So the two huge target areas for lifestyle interventions, firstly, are not people with non-communicable symptoms. And we'll see in a minute um, how that presents. And these are sort of often nebulous, you know, people who come in with lots of different things, you know, headache, weight gain, tiredness, joint pains, heartburn, tired all the time. And um, this approach can really help this group of patients. The other thing, and, and learning point number two in terms of a paradigm shift, is that if you leave these people with non-communicable symptoms for long enough and you don't get to the root causes, they will end up with a chronic disease or more than one chronic disease. This is, this is the kind of thing that we is, is novel to medics because we, we don't, we're just not trained like that. We're not taught about that. And when we learn etiology back at med school, it's often a bit inadequate. And I remember that I used to work for a, a vascular surgeon and he, um, he sort of, he nipped out of the room and said, right, come up with the etiology of thyroid cancers. And so we were like, yeah, well, why do people get thyroid cancers? And so I'd written this whole list on toxins and whatever. And he just meant classifying them in terms of papillary and follicular. And I just thought, that's not etiology. That's just what they are, you know. And that's part of the problem. You get a lot of what and no why. Non-communicable disease is on the rise. That's the point I'm trying to make. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that there's a list there of things that we see a lot of in primary care. Depression. Celiac disease, IBS, food intolerances, we'll come, we'll come to those later on. Uh, connective tissue disorders, endocrine disorders, you know, Hashimoto's, thyroid problems. And I've, I've segmented them there. I didn't need to really, because once you're in this model, you realize that these diseases have a lot in common. And at this point, I want, you may not, you might be sitting there thinking, what, what the heck has schizophrenia got in common with IBS? Just, just sort of let it wash over you for now and let your grey matter start thinking about why that might be the case. What could, all the, what could Alzheimer's have in common with gastroparesis, for example? Does it have anything in common? Just, just start thinking about that. Think about etiology. Go back to this thinking about the root cause, the why of the why. That's what we're trying to get to. And think about processes and about symptom, systems. So you don't have to don't, think, don't overthink it, just get used to that way of thinking. Okay, the next slide is the, the elephant. Everyone's seen this slide. It's just um, the way medicine is at the moment. Um, you know, so you've got this elephant, you've got a colorectal person, you've got a dermatologist by the looks of it, there's an orthopedic person at the bottom, a podiatrist, an ENT, and a neurosurgeon by the looks of it on this, this elephant. But the point is everyone's just looking at their bit and no one's looking at the whole. And in lifestyle medicine, it's about what I call super generalism. You're not looking 
deeper and deeper and deeper because you'll just you'll, you'll just you'll miss the big picture what you're doing is you're looking broader you're looking for lots multiple things that you can tighten up the screws on that makes the whole system work better because we're talking about systems it's a bit like Occam's razor you go for the most obvious things um, and you think wait a second you know just by doing this one thing these four things may improve and that patient's symptoms often 10 or 15 symptoms will suddenly diminish and sometimes disappear altogether. So this is not the way medicine was designed to be practiced in terms of keeping people well and getting them better. This is a quite an outdated model, but unfortunately how the world of conventional medicine still works. Yeah.